So perhaps we can just start. Um, um, I would like to welcome uh, everybody to this new initiative from the academic service, uh, which we've called the Lunch on Discussion Series, where we would like to discuss aspects of the networked scholar, which is all about how online tools, online platforms, online possibilities um, might change or might not change uh, a scholarship. So why do we think that this series could be useful here um, at the UI? Um, I think there is a lot happening currently, um, that there is moves where higher education goes online, and I think it could be useful just to bring in a discussion here at the EOI, what does that mean? Uh, what are all the various dimensions of this, uh, of this move online? And, um, and also to see, is, this, uh, is these various tools which we can use today online, is it something which simply is an additional useful tool which might be useful or might not be useful, or is it something that um, goes so far as to change scholarly practices? And I think it would be good, because you are moving, as young researchers, you are moving in a world which is quite dynamic um, and which is changing, and um, I think it's good to have a discussion about this here at the UI, an open and frank uh, discussion, and also the sharing of experience, what works, what doesn't work. So if we look at scholarly practices, I think there's four we can talk about, and I, I would suggest that we take it a little bit as a lens today during our discussion, so um, of course we all do publish our work um, and just to give you an example how we can think of how online might change things for academics in the traditional activity um, of publishing, there is for example a huge discussion, an academic discussion about peer reviewing and whether it's fair or whether it's not fair and um, um, there is the discussion whether an online transparent public peer review could change or could improve the peer review process. So this is just one of the examples. Another uh, practice, what, what are we doing as researchers? We are, of course, we are doing research. How could online, what can online offer to researchers? It can, for example, give access to new data, um, free access, open access to new data, and it can also offer to find um, solutions by crowdsourcing, by, by um, uh, asking people to um, hand in their ideas to a problem and to, to solve it online. Um, of course, there's all this movement of open educational resources, online teaching, so this does pose a lot of questions. How do we organize our teaching in the future, particularly as there will be a lot of more people who have, be ta who have to be taught, a lot of more undergraduate people in the future. So what are you going to do there um, in your teaching practices? Um, and also networking. Of course, we are networking as researchers. We try to reach out to other people. And um, online networking, I guess we will discuss it today, might allow for you young research to get in touch with more senior um, academics, leading academics who are across the Atlantic or somewhere else. So I would propose that perhaps during this discussion, these online dimension, uh, which in my mind makes knowledge accessible, so you can access it whenever you want, from whatever device you want, from wherever, uh, wherever you want, as long as you have an internet cable. It's open, so it's free access to information, it's interactive, so you're not only pushing information out there, but people are giving feedback, and it's instantaneous. You might not have to work three years until your article is published, but you can just publish it, you can write a blog post on it. And to, to see all these various dimensions we are discussing today through, through these uh, four, four lenses. And of course it also poses a question whether we welcome online or we don't welcome online, but it does pose a question um, what the role of higher education institutions on for us as researchers is um, for knowledge, for the creation of knowledge and for the sharing of knowledge. So Twitter, today we are going to discuss on Twitter, which is one of these online tools. And uh, usually what is said about Twitter is, Twitter, seriously, as an academic, how can such a brief medium have any relevance to universities and academia where journal articles are 3,000 to 8,000 words long and where books contain 8,000 words? Can anything of academic value ever be said in just 140 characters? I think some of you might have come across these or similar things. and. 
we will we are going to discuss this openly uh, today with with you what we did do when you registered for this event we asked you so do you think twitter is worth or is it not worth for academic practice and about one third of you said well i don't really know whether twitter is really worth my time to invest. And I wanted to share some of your comments here because I found it quite interesting what you said about. So some of you have said Twitter is useful to create an active and informed public sphere. As a social scientist, I have to engage in a public debate. It is there to conduct, uh, to contact with uh, academics around the globe instantly. Um, it's for collecting information about what is going on all around the world in terms of conference and publications. It's an open, transparent discussion on precise topics in a public and easy way. Uh, it's increasing publicity for your scholarly work. Uh, it's for the impact of your research outcome is today exposed in social media and soon impact factor will not be the only way to measure scholarly impact, so impact factors is for you the big pressure as young scholars here, or also as not young scholars, but if you want to achieve tenure track positions, the citation of your work is of course very important. Researchers must find a way to communicate their results outside academia. Twitter is the hardest way, but uh, the most immediate. Ability in using Twitter is a new skill to be developed. Finding catchy short sentences for summarizing long research story is challenging. Um, I'm very unfamiliar with Twitter, not having account myself, but in fact, sorry, I didn't know that this was coming out this way. So, but I want to learn about the possibilities to reach out to a more global audience. And some, uh, somebody said, I tried to stay away from Twitter because I thought that academia is about the search for the truth, which cannot comply with word and time limits, but maybe I'm wrong, I want to learn more. I found this interesting because for me it was an example of crowdsourcing, which was happening here. So all your comments did touch upon different aspects of what Twitter might do or might not do. Uh, bringing it together gives a quite nice overview what it potentially could be. Today, today's online advocates or Twitter advocates, uh, let me introduce you the panel. Um, we have Deborah Dubald from the History uh, Department, a third year researcher who's an active Twitter um, researcher, uh, Twitter user. We have uh, Jean-Michel Professor Glashaw from the, he's the director of the Florence School of Regulation at the Schumann Center and uh, professor of economics. And we have uh, Martin Scheinin, the Dean of Graduate Studies, whom probably most of you know, and uh, he's also professor at the Law Department of International Law and Human Rights. And what is interesting, if I now would click on the hyperlinks here, you would go to the Twitter account of these people, and uh, somebody of you said, I'm interested to follow this discussion because I'm interested in the interactive business card. And I think that's exactly what Twitter also can be. If I go to their account, I immediately know who they are, what they are interested in, so I get immediately an, an access to what these people are interested in, what they are sharing, what, what they care about uh, in their professional and also in their personal life. We also have started already, some of you have contributed already, we started before the discussion today, um, we had a hashtag EUI tweets and a lot of you have already contributed and shared uh, literature on Twitter, how do academics use social media, um, shared their opinions, so we have already started a little bit of, of discussion going on and this is then a nice example also how Twitter can be used in, uh, in, uh, uh, ahead, of a, ahead of conference. I would like to stop here and give over to Niklas who is going to moderate the discussion today. Um, Niklas, please. Uh, good afternoon and thank you all for coming to our little event. Um, I can understand why uh, a lot of people might be a bit hesitant to join Twitter or look at Twitter or engage with Twitter. Every time I open Twitter the pound seems to lose value so it's not the most pleasant experience at the moment and if you uh, expand on any tweet about the uh, state of British politics there's a stream of um, reactionary comments underneath it which I think would dissuade any sensible person from being there. But having said that, um, this job that I'm currently in now, I mean the first job I got at the EUI I found out about on Twitter and my next job at a magazine in London um, I got because people were tweeting about me so um, it might be worth saying what we're we missing by not being on Twitter if that's where the opportunities are going uh, we should try and understand it, even if elements of Twitter uh, occasionally repel us a little bit. Uh, but we also have to remember that it can um, encourage and invite us to dismiss the nuances of complicated arguments. Um, 
So we're going to discuss that today, and if you want to join in, please do. If you want to, if you think we're really out of touch and you want to call us dinosaurs, please do. Uh, but we'll start with Martin Shining and a little presentation. Yeah, I'm, I'm a little bit old-fashioned in the sense that I still use PowerPoint as well. <laughs> and I, I prepared ten, 10 slides for this event, and the first one is follow me on Twitter. There's my Twitter handle on the first slide. I'm at uh, 1,977 followers today, so 23 to go, and I hope to get them from this, this event. <laughs> the first set of slides is about using Twitter as a source, as a resource in your own research. And it is my strong advice that one should start there. So th the first slide is about what do we want to do with Twitter, and it's about thinking about your strategy before you start tweeting yourself. And I think it was among uh, Nicholas's questions for us, when did you join Twitter? And I looked, I joined Twitter April 2012, but I waited one year before my first tweet. So the first, for the first year I was only stalking, collecting a meaningful Twitter feed of people that I follow and that I find useful. And I've been always ruthless in unfollowing people who I don't find useful. So I, I really um, have uh, learned that Twitter is my first source of news, generally, and my first source of issues of academic interest for me. I've been working a lot on counterterrorism and surveillance, which are, of course, issues which are daily developing, and that's why if you want to be a leading academic in those fields, you need to follow developments at the UN, at Council of Europe, in the EU, you follow different courts, you follow different academics, and I have designed my list of people I follow, so that I'm trying to keep it to 200. Now I'm maybe at 208, but not much above 200, in order to be able to read it on a daily basis. Most people who follow back everybody who follows them end up with following 1,000 people, and if you are following 1,000 people, you are not following anybody. <laughs> you, it's unmanageable. So Twitter is a source for research materials. Uh, I think that's the primary thing, and I put the number one when I, I speak of strategy. I put number one after that. Secondly, it's a discussion forum where you get feedback in relation to your own work. And uh, that can be done in 140 characters when you are commenting what already has been published, you, you give a smart comment, or then you publicize your own work, which is then the next, next number three in your strategy is publication channel for your own work, and I will get soon to how you can do it in 140 characters. You can have a Twitter account for a project, research project, which would be an institutional instead of individual. And then there's the fifth use of promoting yourself as an individual. So it's a wonderful device for self-promotion, but I'm deprioritizing that use. I f see that too many academics are in Twitter merely for self-promotion, and then they tweet about their dog and about their breakfast and what music they happen to be listening every day, and I'm unfollowing those people ruthlessly. I'm not interested in their non-academic work. So think about it while you are still only following others and before you start tweeting and design for yourself a profile for, for uh, then being a tweeter yourself, um, gradually expanding from the first one to the others on my list and avoid becoming an academic narcissist um, we, our work is quite lonely. We sit mornings, days, evenings at our desk, our computer. Sometimes we read books, sometimes we just stare at the screen. And then we interact with the world through electronic media such as Twitter. And it's a, it's a, it's a capturing, addictive thing, but you may become a narcissist, which you shouldn't at a young age. Save it for later. <laughs> and Designing the list who you follow is important also for your time management. I think you should think how much time you want to allocate to Twitter in advance before you get captivated and addicted. How Twitter can be a source for research, 
um, identify interesting people and check who they follow. You build them up your list of who you follow by finding the most relevant for yourself and looking who they depend on. And then you end up with 200, which I think is a good rule of thumb, not to go much beyond 200 because it, it becomes impossible soon after that. And then you identify what kind of sources you want to find. And, and I've listed cases. I'm a legal scholar, so we need court cases. We need to follow people who are court followers because they tweet about interesting cases. Academic papers, uh, events that are happening here or elsewhere, uh, news, I mean main, line, main news items which are relevant for me, and blog posts. So it's, it's, uh, many blogs are connected to a Twitter feed and you get a notice from new blog posts by following their Twitter feeds and it's much easier than remembering to check the blogs separately on a daily basis. Um, you end up valuing differently different types of tweeters and I find individual academics as the most useful category. Then I find, find uh, uh, celebrities and narcissists as medium <laughs> useful because there are pearls but there's also much garbage which easily results in unfollowing them but, but when they are leading academics there's also the good stuff. And then I find often less helpful institutional accounts and I think that maybe is a warning against creating an institutional account because they tend to become too neutral, too, too curated, too edited, dumbed down. And, and for instance, this is just an example, there is a Twitter feed for the Inter-American Commission of Human Rights, which tweets every day with a link to their newest press release. And there's no substance whatsoever. It's like, here's our newest press release and a link. Who wants to follow that kind of a Twitter feed? Nobody. Um, set a limit early on how many you want to follow and keep checking regularly. Uh, change upwards only gradually and uh, take time then to read regularly your own Twitter feed in order to make use of the sources you have identified as a good one. There are then tricks how to control and, and complement your own timeline. If you want to put the limit in 200 and still know that there's stuff out there which is useful, um, you can mute some people who tweet too much generally and then you can easily toggle on or off the muting so that if you find something happening soon and you want to follow them again, you unmute them and then you mute them back after, uh, after the event is over. You can follow hashtags to complement your list of 200. For instance, now these weeks you have been following the hashtag EUI tweets now and then when you have five minutes extra, you check what's happening on that list. And then use of lists. And here you should rely on other people's list instead of building from scratch. There are, for instance, lists of uh, EUI people with a Twitter account. So if you have your daily look at the 200 people you are following, you could have a weekly look at the EUI tweeters. Just quickly go through what they have been up to. Um, and that's then your way towards creating your own lists. Um, building up on others and then following the hashtags. This is what I already said. Um, serious academics is one hashtag which is worth looking at now and then. There's, for instance, the question whether serious academics use Twitter. <laughs> and I, I think they do. Moving then to tweeting yourself. When you establish an account, your, what's it called, avatar? Mm -hmm is an egg. And of course, what comes out of an egg is a bird. So <laughs> you are moving from an egg that is hatching to a bird that is flying. And then the bird is able to tweet. That's the metaphor here. You will not get followers unless you start tweeting. Uh, some people conscientiously follow back. So when you build up your follow list of who people you follow, maybe 200, you may get a number of people who follow you even before your first tweet. And here's the joke, how I started to tweet. I was sitting in a conference like this and said, well, when I get to 100 people who follow me, then I have to start tweeting. And 
one of the people in the room was an active tweeter and he sent the message around and in 20 minutes I had 100 followers. So <laughs> it was also a demonstration of the power of Twitter, that you can mobilize people who are far away just by creating interest. Uh, remember that Twitter is public. So in principle, almost everything is public, uh, including when you engage in fights in Twitter. You use the uh, Twitter hashtag in the beginning of a tweet to reply to somebody, to target somebody, but still they are also public on your own timeline and people can search those tweets. A direct message is something which is not public and that requires that you are following the person and the person is following you. Only then you can send direct messages. So that's useful and, and I find it um, a more efficient way to capture the attention of busy academics who are active tweeters than email. If I say send an email, it may go unresponded, but if I send a direct message, I get a response, 100% when we speak of people who are active users of Twitter. So, um, one should not devalue the um, replies, which start with the hashtag of the person you have replied to, because even though it initially goes, I think, only to that person, plus your common followers, something like that, which is a small, small group, uh, when the recipient retweets, it can go wild. And I have noticed that some of my most successful tweets during a month are actually replies to a politician or somebody else who has a big group of followers and who then retweets my reply. So it's not private. <laughs> um, you can keep an eye on the reception of your tweets. There are various tools already inside Twitter. If you click different parts, you get a view and your, if you look at your own tweets, there's a way to look how many people have read it, etc. But there's also a separate um, service called Twitter Analytics, which gives you more information, including of the demographics of your followers and the reception of your tweets. Then there's something called Buffer, which allows you to avoid being seen to tweet in the middle of the night. It's bad form to tweet at 3 a.m. People think you are obsessed with Twitter and, and <laughs> you don't have a life. So you can do that at 3 a.m., but buffer it to be sent at 10 a.m. the following morning. <laughs> On various devices, there are then other apps, which I won't go into. Um, <clears throat> some ideas about getting and losing followers. Following people back is a safe way to increase your following, but it's going to damage your use of Twitter. So I'm, I've restricted myself to 200 and I don't follow people back and I don't feel bad about it. I don't feel bad about muting people. I don't feel bad about unfollowing people. Just do it ruthlessly. When you don't tweet, you don't get followers, but if you tweet too much, you lose people like me. <laughs> And if you t tweet beyond your own expertise, you easily le lose people who simply don't care. Uh, you lose more people by tweeting too much than you gain uh, through that way. And that applies also to conference tweeting, which is a separate slide here. In conferences, you easily get 10 followers quickly, but you may lose 20 others <laughs> when you are too much repeating what's being said in the room. Um, one should, in my view, build consciously some kind of a profile, tweeting profile, based on your expertise and then stick to that expertise. That means choose in what languages you will be tweeting. Do you include your national language or do you do just in English? Then try to be original. There are a lot of people who retweet far too much so that it's already a cause for unfollowing that they retweet so much. I'm trying, for instance, to retweet with, a, with an original comment. And that's one of the most effective ways to tweet is to find somebody's tweet relevant and useful and then add an original comment. Avoid going personal unless you want your profile to be personal. Some people think that one could be a personality also in Twitter. I don't. I think one should be an academic. And then when you build up your profile, you will have certain responsibility because people pick you to follow because they know 
you are a reliable source about state of emergency in Turkey or EU counterterrorism directive, so then you must live up to your expectation, the expectations towards you. There will be Twitter fights where uh, trolls will attack what you said. A good rule of thumb is don't reply to anybody with less than 500 followers. <laughs> because then the troll is just going to doing self-promotion, hoping that you will get agitated and you will promote them by replying, uh, including their Twitter handle in your tweet, which will, you want to send to a broader public. I find it useful when you are subject to tro trolls uh, to reply, but without their hashtag. They follow you anyway. They will get your response, but don't mention them. Um, and one should be always conscious whether to start a fight in Twitter. Don't take it too far. Don't engage too long. One short comment is usually enough, and if it's a troll without their hashtag. Then something about getting around the 140 character limit, which is the question academics use, uh, academics pose. How can I say anything meaningful? First of all, good tweets have a link to something which is online. URL shortening tools exist, and Twitter itself shortens everything to 23 characters or something like that. But sometimes you find a separate shortening tool useful. Then you can do sequenced tweets marked with a number one out of four, for instance. You, can, you get around the 150 character link. I tested two days ago doing a legal commentary on the EU counterterrorism directive by tweeting eight tweets in a sequence, eight times 140 characters. The first one has a link to the leaked non-public document, and then the rest of the seven have critical comments. And you can say quite a lot in eight times 140 characters. Um, some sort of hyperlink should be the default in when tweeting content. You can combine Twitter with a blog, but one of the niceties of Twitter is that you don't need to have your own blog. I'm blogging in four different blogs, and I can always tweet a link to that blog, which I'm that week uh, writing on. And that avoids me having to tweet, uh, log in, <laughs> blog in one place uh, or to establish my own blog. Then you get around the 140 character limit and ar around the difficulties in getting stuff online by using Dropbox. You can have a Dropbox account and then you can link to individual files within it and put that link into Twitter. It works. You can even put them behind a password and uh, put an expiry date if you have a Dropbox Pro mm -hmm. account. Um, you can include a photo, and a photo can, uh, can be a JPG made of text. You can write in Word, you convert it through PDF or directly to JPEG, and then you can post it as a photo, and that's one way to get around the character limit. You can post full academic paragraphs that way, directly in the tweet itself. And then there's a chance to include a poll, which I have never done. But that's one of the options Twitter provides. I said about conference tweeting, that's a good way to get like-minded followers quickly, but also a good way to lose others who are not interested in a particular conference. I find it extremely boring when we have Twitter maniacs in a conference room who try to tweet every word that is said, and they end up tweeting 100 times during an hour. That's not the way to do. Try to be polite and original when conference tweeting, and the emphasis on the word and. Both polite and original. So don't be nasty to the speakers, but add some content by commenting, and don't overdo the conference tweeting. Time management is important. Uh, don't let uh, Twitter overtake your um, personality or your working week. Think about, for instance, two times 30 minutes in a day. Getting up from bed <laughs> after dinner might be the moments when you read your own Twitter feed twice a day. And um, try to resist the temptation to tweet every day. Wait for the original idea. It may come twice a week. 
It may come three times a week, uh, but don't tweet just because you didn't tweet earlier today. And um, then you may have a separate weekly Twitter day to look at also the hashtags and the lists you have created when you need to put an extra hour. This is the final slide which asks the question whether Twitter is doomed. It's old school, it's, it's an elitist platform for people like us, academics, specialists, um, and people speak about the eight-year death sentence in the digital world, and Twitter is about to die. Well, it is not a commercial success, but that's one reason why we academics may become interested in it. And uh, the mode of communication, I think it's quite smart. It's meant for public intellectuals. And that's why it's not for everybody. It, it is a sort of elite platform. Um, there may happen a big commercial takeover by one of the leading uh, internet companies, which then may result in a completely different business model, and suddenly all our personal data is sold and exploited, and we are lo loaded with advertising. But let, let's see whether that day comes. Purchasing Twitter to ourselves through crowdfunding by the users is an option. And there is a link to one initiative on that slide. One interesting advantage of Twitter is that it's gender neutral. A uh, majority of tweeters are women. And, and for instance, my followers, when I was tweeting only about surveillance and counterterrorism, was 70% male. But today, when I have moved to be more of a human rights generalist, it's 50-50. Yesterday it was 50-50, today it's 51 male, 49 women. But that's, I think, an interesting feature of the Twitter universe, that it, even if it's a, uh, maybe perceived as a technology thing, which traditionally would be perceived as male, it is actually neutral. And I prefer Twitter for professional purposes and Facebook for private life. And in Facebook, I'm only friends with my relatives. There's a lot thanks. of food for thought. Uh, yeah. Martin, thanks a lot for sharing all of this. Perhaps we're going a little bit more into the discussion now. And also, I mean, for all of you, there, there, there was a lot of information here. So if you also have questions or if you want to challenge something, then you are more than welcome to intervene any time. But I would suggest, Nick, that you that you provoke a little bit. Uh, yes, thank you, Martin, for your talk. When you were talking about um, uh, not getting into little squabbles, not tweeting at 3 a.m., not letting Twitter take over your life, I couldn't help but think about American politics. <laughs> but I, I digress. So let's make academia great again and ask Deborah, um, if Twitter is becoming an elitist platform, is it the right place for experts to find audiences and audiences to find experts? Why don't you kick us off? Um. Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, it, it's a tricky question. I'm not sure I have an answer. Um, if I judge from my own practice, I don't consider that I am doing elitist stuff on Twitter, and I'm, I'm just there as one member of this huge community that is literally open. Martin mentioned that it was public. It's, a, it's, a, it's an immense space of public space, and I'm just one of them. And we're talking billions, or maybe millions. I have no idea how many uh, Twitter, Twitter accounts there are. So what I do is, should I go on with my own practice and like what I had prepared, or yeah, yeah, do ahead. you want like a precise answer to the question? Um, answer the question if you can, but we'd love to hear your Okay, so I think, um, yeah, I prepared a few notes about my own, my own practice that might maybe answer indirectly uh, the question. Um, so, I'm not sure, maybe the answer that I would say is no, it's not an elitist instrument in the way that when I first came to Twitter, uh, I was a teacher in a, in a secondary school education back in France, and I came to Twitter for two reasons. One, I was looking for support to design my my own uh, teaching, and I was also looking for instruments in order to develop tools to teach digital literacy to my students. So this is something I've been concerned with a lot. And so I came there to look for answers, if you like. So I was not in a position in which I was thinking, oh yeah, I'm, I'm, 
I'm, I don't know, from the top world and I'm going to bring the knowledge to people out on Twitter. Um, then, uh, back then, I already had this PhD project in mind, so I started following a lot of PhD students, uh, very randomly, really, so there's people also have unfollowed ever since, etc. And you really sort of build your, your timeline, your TL, gradually, and it, it changes according to your um, changing interests. For instance, I've removed all secondary education teachers from my TL because they're all French and they complain a lot about the educational system and that just ruined all of my mornings. <laughs> I was one of them, so I have a right to say something about it. And so, no, just to say that it's something that comes through practice and something that changes and there is no recipe to the perfect TL, I would say. Um, so, why and how do I use Twitter? Basically, I do it. I, I use it for personalised daily use. So, when I open Twitter while I'm still in my bed, I think it's the first thing that I do every morning. I'm not sure if that is addiction, but this is how I do it. And then I also switch on the French radio, and then I tweet and I listen to both things at the same time. So I'm trying to multitask, not very efficient. Uh, that I do for an hour every morning, which is very, fairly long. And I read and I go to articles and newspapers article, and my timeline is designed in a way that I read uh, the press or lit, what, bits and pieces of the press, but only from the, not only from the French press, but also from other a country's press, and this is something I really like about Twitter, is this internationalized version of the world that you can get. Even though you always have this filter, which is your own culture, a filter, for instance, I rarely tweet in English, for instance, unless it is professional, but usually I tweet in French because I feel more, I don't know, confident, it feels more natural to tweet in French. Um, so I get a lot of um, um, followers uh, from France, obviously, and less from English-speaking countries or other uh, countries. Then I also, well, I use it for scholarly information, for call for papers um, and conferences, conferences that are live tweeted, etc. I also use it, and this is really important, and that has changed my life as, as, a, as a PhD researcher. I use it for IT support. So, so whenever I have an issue with Zotero, or when I have an issue about what is it, the, the tool that I use to do that or this, or whatever, uh, I ask out the Twitter community and they come to my rescue and say, oh, you should do this. Or they connect you to some link where the whole routine is described. And there is a lot of people out there that share their IT practices, and this is incredibly helpful. Um, I also use it for, say, more support, but also scientific emulation. There are a couple of people, I wouldn't say all of them, but there's, um, say, 10 people that I really like to read because they get me going in the morning. You read what they say and you're like, oh, yes, that's the way to do it. And, and now I'm going to do science as well and we're going to be a great community of researchers. So it's not competition. I would really call this emulation and sometimes it not only gives you ideas, so in that way I guess it changes it changes the research or the, the, the practices of research, but it also um, yeah, gives you energy. And yes, um, then I hope, I hope my account is not an elitist account, but I'm well aware that I'm not followed by people who are not in academia, for instance. There's my mother, uh, who likes all of my tweets. <laughs> Maybe she, she even listens to me now. Uh, so, but I don't never necessarily reach out to people who are not historians, for instance. So I don't think they would see me as elitist. I don't want to be seen as, a, as an elitist um, um, Twitter account. 
What I like to do with my account in more generally is to use it as a visiting card. And even though it doesn't, it's not like the recipe for success and you open tomorrow, you open your account and bam, you've got a job. Um, it's something that where you build social relations with people. And even through social relations, you get to know people in a different way. And you also get to know um, academics in a different way. Academics have a life and they read newspapers that are not connected to their research. And they share things that are different from what they do in their professional, say, environment. And I think it shows a side of research which is very interesting also to us as researchers. It's not just reading and working and thinking, producing and publishing, etc. It's also all sorts of things. And I'm a historian of science and what I do is trying to deconstruct this grand narrative or yeah, there's the scholar or like the scientific genius who was born and then he had this discovery just because it's a genius. And I'm trying to deconstruct this and show the practices of science in my own area, which is 19th century. But I'm very happy to participate maybe in sort of um, showing the, the, the back, not the back sides, the, um, how do you say that? Um, the, uh, the back room of research, if you like. So, no, not an elitist tool, I hope. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Um, I can see that John Michelle's phone is held together with tape. It's showing the scars of years of excessive <laughs> tweeting. Um, John Michelle, why don't you tell us about your experience and what you've done to both of your mobile phones? I would like to know what to say. Uh, I do not know much because it's mainly something I do, so I do not think about it. Uh, but I can tell why I did start. It's the same. So I'm director of a team, let's say. I'm the head of a team because it's a small team, where, let's say 20 people. And uh, my deputy was Annika, and Annika as a deputy, and she, she was nice, she was good. And she was uh, continuously telling me, uh, you have to use Twitter, you have to use Twitter. And at a point I thought, if I do not do, I will look stupid for this young, dynamic uh, girl. So, okay, so do it to me. So she did choose the name the code, and I cannot remember the code, so I have to write the code to remember who I am, etc. And I did start uh, doing things. What, what I did discover, what was really strange for me, it's quite natural. If you, if you are an intellectual, you think all the time. You have ideas, you react, uh, you agree, and uh, you are searching. You are searching... Um, new evidence, counter-evidence, uh, you would like to be aware of things. And as I am both of a team, it's good to do my work to have visions in areas I do not master, but I need to understand not only the basics, but I need to understand how it evolves today and tomorrow and because of what. Uh, pam, 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 pam. And also I need to be able to come back if I am told, Jean-Michel, do you know Charles uh, Ewitt? I will say, oh, not at all. Well, you're stupid. It's a very well known. Up, up. I'm going to my. And I'm, I'm, I'm trying to find something. And when you are lucky, which means when you find the Twitter account, it takes two minutes to scan the person, which is incredible because it is stored. And um, it is logical, there are issues treated with this Twitter record. In two minutes, you think, wow, I'm stupid, I didn't know the guy. Or, I'm so smart, I did ignore this guy. <laughs> <laughs> so it's extremely useful. And you can do what I adore, which is to search, not knowing what you search. I adore entering into a bookshop and looking at a book and seeing that there is many other books, or taking a book and looking at the references. And if I like the author of the book and I have three references with the same name and I do not know this name, I feel stupid and I want to dig more. I do now with a Twitter account. I do agree with Martin, which is something which is fantastic. 
you are searching, so you are investigating, and you are discovering something new. But as you have link, you, you can get the full article, or the website, or the blog, and then you really investigate. And it's not stupid to, to have five minutes of totally free hunting, and then to spend 15 or 20 minutes to really read the, the, the um, uh, attached documents. And it's an excellent way of uh, discovering. And I adore it, and I'm not a PhD student, so I can use my time my way. When I was a PhD student, I was doing the same, but it took me 10 years to, to finish my PhD. So I should be dead today, but I'm 66, so I'm half dead, so it compensates. So what I, uh, I am also willing to say is about Twitter, Facebook, uh, LinkedIn, and Instagram. I did try the four. I did so Facebook after six weeks. Why? Because I did see that I have my brothers, my sister, um, my relatives, uh, my PhD students, my colleagues. I do not. I do not learn anything. I see what they are, what they do. If they have a new jacket, okay, I have one too. You can see it's a beautiful one. But uh, it, no, it doesn't fit with me. I did stop. I have an Instagram account, I did do, I did stop after one year. I have a LinkedIn account, I did stop too, because LinkedIn is so institutional that it's wonderful to know what is become this person. This is wonderful. But, but it's not a day-to-day -day, um, practice. Well, Twitter, I do quite every day. And I said, I am both of a team, so I want to have visions about the topics treated by my team. I am also this team, is also the head of a network, because um, we, are, we are called the Front School of Regulation. So we have 20 people here, but, but we have 200 everywhere. And I have to follow the topics followed by this network, and I have to show that we are still alive. It has been very well flagged by Martin. Well, I do differently the flagging, but, but I do agree that you have to flag that you are there, that you have a brain, and that you know what you do. It does not matter for me too much to know if you do it twice a week, twice a day, two times every hour, but you have to flag something. If you want to be taken into account, because you can have a totally passive practice of uh, Twitter. So to, to, keep, to keep a rank in my network, I use a lot Twitter. Most of my colleagues in this network are not using it. But it does not contradict, because they know that I'm using. They know that I'm saying things here, and and it's enough to to master the 200 people in the network. I would love doing what uh, Martin does to have 200 accounts that I will really follow. I cannot. I really follow 10 to 20. Uh, let's say half being people and half being institutions. As I do a regulation, I want to know what are the novelties. I did discover uh, two days ago that uh, the, the European regulator for energy did issue three reports since the end of September. I was not aware, now I am. That's typically the use of it. Now I will, uh, I will treat also the elite part of it. I do agree with Martin, except uh, the number. It's Elites, we should say, eh? which means each milieu will have its own self-created elite, the, the typical uh, what you do, eh? and um, you can jump from one elite to the other, and you can create your elite, and now I will uh, add a last word on uh, Twitter and personal things. As I had um, an, um, a professional Twitter account, I thought uh, last year, yeah, last year for my birthday, I will open my old personal Twitter account because then I can split into a professional and a personal. But I made a mistake. My personal account had my name too. After several months, I did see that it didn't work because I'm a boss and 
not only my team, because I do not care what Nick really thinks about me, but I care when it is a director general for the Energy Ad Commission, when it is a director for regulation in the big utility, so I care much what they think about, not about me as a person, but me as somebody you can trust. If this guy speaks, it's because he knows something. So I did decide to kill this uh, second Twitter account. It, w it was already 600 followers. I did kill it in February. I did recreate a third Twitter account, totally anonymous, with a false name. It is the name of the brother of my grandmother, but what you cannot know is that the brother of my grandmother does not have the same name like my grandmother for very obscure reasons. And then that's my name. And it took me three months to reach 500 followers. If you have a point, you really want something, you really, you really like it, you, you are really interested. When you wake up, you have something. It, either to say or to learn, you will have followers. Because, because the speed at which you screen Twitter, you can screen 30 people in two minutes. And if you, if you have something relevant, you, you, you stop and you dig in. And so I have this third Twitter account, totally, uh, totally anonymous. So I do not know how many people are following me, but you will know in one minute, because as my official account, I have 2,400, and the private, private, so anonymous, 550. And I did write already 4,000 tweets anonymous. And I deeply think about it. I have a very good friend in Argentina, another one in Brazil, another in Spain, one in uh, French-speaking uh, Canada. They do not know me because I'm anonymous. I expect they do the same. But we exchange, which is extremely surprising because you immediately see if the person has something to say, is authentic or joking or flirting. I have nothing about flirting, but, but it's useless. There is many other way of flirting. And uh, so as you can see, I have, I have two different practices of Twitter. I, uh, I warmly recommend both. The amount of time, I do agree with Martin, you can go down to 30 minutes a day, which is, and you can start with 15. Less than 15 a day, the practice is too small, you will forget everything. But with 15, you will do. What else? Twitter, Facebook, empirical, intuitive, network, screening, phishing, they really smart, met for the list, pam pam. I did say everything. And it's for free, the last thing. <laughs> so it may disappear one day, but it's totally free. Huh? It won't cost you anything except time. Hallelujah. Can I add something to this? Because when I was a young researcher starting here um, in my first year, I do not know, we had, we had some, some training, I do not remember what it was, but I remember that we were told as a young researcher, or, or anyway, as an academic, you should invest one third of your time not writing your thesis, but on networking. One third of your time going to conferences, writing to colleagues, uh, discussing with colleagues. So. I do not know whether this still holds true today, whether this is still an advice, but it was at that time, and Twitter is, of course, ingenious for this, because you can sometimes avoid going to conferences. Um, okay, John michel thank you for that uh, very interesting contribution. If you want to know what I really think about it, you can check my Facebook page. <laughs> um, so I'll just uh, come back to Martin. Martin, can you uh, tell us if the rules that you've been laying out apply to every field? or just ones that are connected to what's going on in the public sphere and in the news at the moment? I'm, I'm sure there is need for modification in the sense that, that not every academic needs to feel the pulse of world politics every day. There can be people who look back, historians of course, I think their life is more interesting if they feel the pulse of the world, but they don't need to do it. So certainly part of my normative rules that I'm offering are specific and, and more, more appropriate for legal and social science scholars and even then 
to those who deal with a topic which is of public interest. Uh, yeah, so let's go, let's go back to our historian, um, because obviously John Michel is following developments in energy every hour of okay. every day, um, and Martin is working in a hot political issue. So how is it different for you? Politics, you mean? I'm not really interested. Um, I, I'm a historian, so everything that is short-lived and very recent, I found just <laughs> entertaining and sometimes really <laughs> embarrassing also. Um, so I look at that with a distance and think, well, well, we did that in the 19th century or even before already, so what's the point? <laughs> um, in, in maybe in a more serious way, um, I, I don't know. Um, I don't. I, I don't really know what to say. In fact, <laughs> perhaps I can just use this uh, to add that Nick and I have just published a blog which is called "Tweeting Historians an Oxymoron," because we are asking how can a historian really be interested in using Twitter, and uh, we're trying to find some answers there. So we we will be sharing this with you. Sorry, no, just a word. I'm saying this in a very personal way, but I'm not sure all historians would agree, of course. So I'm not speaking for the historian community. I don't want to be speaking for the historian community here. Um, but I, I guess then, I mean, it, it goes down to what everyone's interested in also personally, so. Okay, great. Um, I think I'll, I'll, I'll open it to you know, any questions from the rest of the room. If anyone's curious or you want to add anything, perhaps, anything, because uh, soon we're going to hand over custody to the communication service.